Mr. Marcin Makovsky is a journalist at the weekly Dojeci and Virtualna Polska. Historian, philosopher, Kraków, Poland, as part of his information. World War II in computer games. Visible education tool or rewriting, rewriting the past. Mr. Makowski, you here? Well, in that case, <laughs> um, why don't we uh, take a break? Okay, it's the red clock. Oh, better yet, Mr. Makowski's here. He goes first, and then we'll have the clock. Sorry about that. All right. Uh, sorry for a little bit uh, hard start. We were trying to establish the presentation. Of course, as, is, as in conferences, it wasn't easy. I have a different laptop, different style. I would like to uh, say when the next uh, slide will be uh, presented because I don't have a pilot as well, but I will try to do my best. Uh, I would like to encourage you to, uh, at the starter, uh, to read the perfect quote for my presentation that everyone has here uh, at the front of you. Uh, if you do not claim your own history, someone else will write it for you. That is exactly the story of the computer games and the Second World War and how Poland is presented in this uh, particular sphere of the influence, especially important for the young generation. And this is, as a starter, maybe some obvious fact for the historians, but this is what we are dealing with in the matter of young generation and computer games and their knowledge of the history. 66% of millennials cannot identify what Auschwitz, Birkenau, that camp, German, that camp in Poland is. 22 of, million, of millennials from the United States uh, haven't heard of the Holocaust at all. That's what we are starting. And if we are comparing the main source of knowledge for the young generation, that is that supposed to be books to the computer games industry, uh, the differences is just simply beyond comparison right now. The basic facts and the basic pattern of gaining the knowledge about Second World War, its history, and Poland in it, it's supposed to be books of the history, but it's no longer uh, the, the case. This is a completely different world. As you can see, for example, as a comparison, how much average US citizen is spending for the literature, and that means also a newspapers compared to computer games, for example, or how many hours or minutes it's spending to look at the computer games or to read a book. And what we are dealing in a matter of this kind of numbers, this is clearly and certain that we are speaking about the different paradigm of how young people is learning about the history. And this is through the entertainment, through the computer games, and this is why it is important. Next slide, please. So my main thesis is that games are the history textbooks for the young generation. And deal with that. We, we just simply cannot deny that this is right now uh, our reality. Historians, journalists, everyone who would like to share their knowledge about the facts and the narrative, and the Polish uh, uh, and the Polish version of the history, our narrative in the Second World War, World War, have to deal with that fact that there is no longer young person reading uh, Norman Davies' book, but uh, for example, playing Battlefield Five. And another, please. And this is not also an industry that is easy to say that is not important, not significant, only for the, for the young people. This is a mainstream. Uh, computer game industry is somehow, maybe, for some regions of the world, more important, more influential, more valued than movie industries. This is the movie of the 21st century billions of dollars in revenues, uh, 10 billions of dollars growth consecutively a year, two and a half billion 
gamers around the world. That also includes, I guess, some of you who plays also computer games on their cell phones. You are also a gamer, if you like it or not. And this is the reality that we are living in four years ago in Poland, one of the eSport tournament. Can I ask to please to dim the light a little bit because I will, have to, I will also show the, some movies. Uh, so this is the mainstream of the computer gaming industry and uh, I would like to ha ask for the second slide, another slide. And this is also the vision of the history in the computer games. Now we are uh, heading to the main, uh, my main thesis of, of this presentation. What we are dealing with, how this world looks like through the eyes of the gamers, programmers, and people who played the games. Uh, can I ask for... We are dealing with the world almost completely colonized by the Western and Soviet narrative. Computer games about Second World War are mostly about landing in Normandy, opening the Second Front, Soviets fighting with the Nazis. Uh, you can see that on the covers of the games. There is simply no other narrative about the Second World War history. And this is how it looks uh, in the example. Another slide. This is the w movie that opens one of the most influential games ever. That is called Call of Duty World War II. It's been sold in 200 million copies worldwide. And this is how the game starts. We have September 1st, 1939. This is something not common in the games. So you might think, oh, it's Poland. It's going to be in Warsaw, right? No. The world starts in Paris. <laughs> Maybe something else. No. The second act of the war is bombardment of the London. unfortunately without the voice, so I will be a narrator. So you might think, what happened in between 1940 and 1944, 45? So many things. But through the eyes of the American programmers, there is a Normandy landing just after the London bombardment in 1944. This is how the story of the Second World War developed without Poland, without Soviet Union, without so many things in between. This is 1939, somewhere around the Paris, London, and heroical acts of American soldiers fighting in Bastogne Forest, Berlin, uh, not in Berlin, uh, to the route to, to the Rhine River, and everything that we know from the history books and movie movies and TV series like, uh, like the, the series about Band of Brothers. So that, that's it. That's going to be enough. The next slide, please. Uh, OK, this game has also a DLC, the addition, no, 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 uh, the addition to the game, which is called The Resistance. So you might feel, think, okay, they skipped Poland in the main narrative, but of course, if you are doing a DLC about the resistance, we cannot do that without Home Front Army, without probably the largest resistance forces ever uh, in the history of war. And you cannot do a DLC about the resistance without Warsaw Uprising, the biggest uprising during the Second World War. So let's see what was all about in that DLC for that game. No, no, uh, please, there is a movie there. If you click, it should play. Okay, it's playing. So right now you're see seeing the story of the resistance fighters all around the Europe. And in the first addition to one billion dollar worth game. What you're about to see 
is a heroic fight on the streets of Paris. That didn't happen like that. It, it like French, France was waiting for the U.S. soldiers just to be at the outskirts of Paris to start the so-called uprising. The second is the Volshanse in East Prussia. This has been portrayed as a resistance fighters fighting <laughs> with the Nazi regime. You can see a Soviet soldiers there as well. <laughs> but the third one is my favorite. There is a Prague uprising. It happened in May 1945 <laughs> when Hitler died, committed suicide, and war pretty much ended. Like a couple of tanks, Hetzer tanks without even a gun, a, a guns was used by the Czech resistance fighter with the armored uh, like machine guns there and some German soldiers just wandering to go back home was chased around the streets. And it's also like in the middle of the Second World War. And the news flash, Warsaw is not presented there. We didn't have an uprising through the eyes of 200 million gamers. And that's mind blowing for me. And of course there is a Nazi zombies addition to this game. You can play with fighting with the Nazi zombies because we know that Nazis are just simply creatures from different dimension. Please, another slide. And this is how the part of this game portrayed a home front army because they gave the player's ability to choose the uniforms. Amongst Dutch resistance, Czech resistance, Hungary resistance, French resistance, pretty much every resistance that had like two fighters was being portrayed there. Amongst those people, home front army with weird guns, weird badges, pretty much everything that is inaccurate to the re historical reality. And they are just one of the many, not the biggest one, but one of the many that you can simply skip and don't bother. And Second World War games has also another very mind boggling issue that is censorship in these games. For example, in one of the important games of the genre, Wolfenstein, uh, in every one of the titles, in many countries, US and Germany especially, uh, there is a censorship of the swastikas, of the, any kind of resemblance to the historical accuracy of the uniforms. Uh, iron crosses looks like some unexisted uh, medals. In the other games, when you don't have swastikas, you have iron cross on the banner of the Third Reich. This is the reality of the computer gaming in 21st century. There is no historical accuracy because there is a clear, a, um, clear threat through the eyes of the programmers and the IT guys and the marketing guys that showing how history looked like in reality would provoke players to be racially aggressive, lean toward Nazism and uh, so they should just suppress that and uh, pretty much whitewash everything in that game. My, uh, one of the best examples of that uh, is uh, just shaving the mustache of the Hitler. In the German version of Wolfenstein II game, uh, German law forbids to promote Nazi symbols, but it not forbids to promote or just to show as a character Hitler or any other uh, Nazi German uh, commander. And in the version, German version of this game, he is called Heimler. And he's not a Fuhrer, but a Chancellor. It's just Chancellor Heimler without a mustache. Who would be afraid of such a guy? He's ridiculous, funny, and this is also uh, something that is really common in the games. Please, another slide also extremely representative case in the computer gaming. There, there is a faceless Nazi without any controversial symbols, like I said before. This is one of the best RTS strategic games ever made. So I'm speaking only about mainstream examples, not some obscure games that the one is playing. I, I love this game personally, but if you play it, you would always see the same pattern. 
different symbols on the uni weird symbols on the uniforms, uh, medals just stripped out of the chest, and just uh, regular soldiers without a face, like like on the First World War, no difference. And how ac historical accuracy looks in those games, looks how gamers would please them to be presented. They would like to choose from the different variety of uniforms, different colors. They would like to play with the game. So the historical accuracy is something that is simply uh, stopping the fun. So we can do pretty much everything with the uniforms and that's how soldiers of the Second World War in Call of Duty World War II looks like. like some random guys from different time periods uh, that could happen anywhere in the world. But to the contrary, when we are speaking about Soviet symbology, uh, there is no problem with that anywhere in the history of computer gaming from the very beginning. You can show any kind of symbol to the communism, referring to the communism and Soviet era in the computer games, and that is perfectly fine. And programmers and IT companies are even playing with that. And they see that this is something that sells in the United States because of the Cold War, because of this is an interesting time period, and no one is seeing Soviet regime communists right now as something similar to Nazi Germany. And if in Poland, this is completely contrary to our history, so we know that those were two. Maybe communism even the worst evil than Nazis because it took longer and it got more, more victim in, in the process. Interesting notion, also mainstream. Pretty much every game about the second world history right now, the shooters, FPS games, has this kind of Nazi zombies episodes, German Nazi war machines, robots. Um, you might have a feeling that Nazism was something that fell out of the sky or from the moon, that this is uh, from the another dimension, another world, pure evil that doesn't have a nationality, origins, and it just happened in the world as a madness that simply infects the people. Uh, this is also something that you are dealing with, playing with games about the Second World War. It's also a concern about how political correctness influenced the games. This is right now very controversial, important, and widely discussed topic. There is a Battlefield 5, also right now extremely popular computer game about Second World War, and how it started with the great debate about the gender diversity issues. Because right now you, you have to have a woman with a machine gun on the front of the game about Second World War, so it will be you know, historically accurate because women, of course, fought in the Second World War. But in my opinion, not how it was presented in the movie. You can see that people are having uh, weird paintings on the faces, weird robotic legs, like women were fighting on the first line of, of the assault in some kind of close combat. Uh, everything is moving, everything is like in a comics uh, sphere, not uh, reality, exploding, flying, tanks are just packed with some kind of weird things on them. And of course this, this woman is, is the main character and it's also, she's also on the cover on the game. So some of the gamers were saying that this is not a battlefield but gender field because historical accuracy was being uh, sacrificed for the today's narrative uh, accuracy. And in the process, because of the backlash, the game was modified and right now is more about the Second World War than about the vision of, and this also happened in that game, uh, black-skinned uh, women dressed in the German uniform fighting with the Allies, because that's what people they thought wanted to see in that game. Please, another slide, that's enough. And it's also interesting how IT companies and programmers don't know about history when they're making a history games. For example, they created to the Battlefield 5 a little addition of a new character that they named Wilhelm Franke, and he's supposed to be 
just, as they say, electronic arts, not a Nazi, but a German soldier, similar to ones we already uh, have in the game. Uh, and they don't want to do any political statement and don't want to show the swastika. That's the regular German soldier <laughs> of the Second World War, that with the mask. In the fact, uh, Wilhelm Franke was one of the German anti-Nazi fighter that died in Dresden. So they <laughs> presented someone who fi fought with the German Nazi regime as a regular soldier who looked like war machine. This is so confusing on so many levels, but this is also the reality of the history in computer games. And another slide. How to make it right? Because I would like to end with some kind of positive <laughs> conclusion. We in Poland are proud to have one of the best computer gaming industry companies around the world. For example, CD Projekt Red is the most valuable Polish company uh, in the market. And we have also a lot of many, uh, maybe just a little bit back, many other companies that are simply great. They're doing one of the best games around the scene. And this market is also more and more worth in Poland. Uh, one and nine hundred billion dollars a year. And we should use them as a tool to make a great valuable quality computer games and as in the United States. How to do that? We have an example, the Witcher 3 game, which is probably one of the highest rated, rated game ever created in the computer gaming industry. 800 awards, game of the year 2016. And this is also something that is truly valuable to an 500 million dollar income. And why gaming, gaming companies should think about Polish history? Because that's the main marketing approach. Because we could say that this is incorrect, this is wrong, this is something that we should not agree upon. But how to make them do the games that will be accurate, better, true, and also entertaining? because we are not living in the fantasy world. We have to deal with the reality. So that's my key points that I would like to present. And Polish and Slavic culture sells. Witcher shows that. This is different, this is exotic, this is something that people might be familiar with, but they don't know why. Because their ancestors were, were from Poland, from Ukraine, from Russia. This is something that you saw, but in a slight different version, like more Tolkien-like, but Slavic culture has this kind of dirt, humor, sex sometimes, something like in which this mixture of dirty version of, farta, of fantasy, which is more similar to our reality. We could do that the same in Second World War computer games. And gamers want to see something new. How many times you can play as a uh, someone who's landing on a Normandy beach. I've done that like 15 times already from different perspective. German soldiers shooting from the bunker to the just uh, one of the many soldiers landing and dying after. How many times you can do that? This is boring after in, you know, 20th time of doing that. And because of that, we have fresh heroes. We have fresh stories. We have untold stories. How many of them are imaginable, un unimaginable? How many heroic acts were never seen by the world? And no one is telling about them. But when you told about them, they're getting an Oscars, like The Pianists or the Agnieszka Holland movies. These are the best-selling stories waiting to be presented to the world and sell to the world, because the world will buy genuine heroical acts that happened we don't have to think about weird stories. We have them. Pilecki, someone who voluntarily went to the death camp, Auschwitz-Birkenau, to create a resistant fighters and then escaped, fought in the war, died, killed by the communists. This is a hard story, but it leads me to the conclusion gamers, in reality, really like the historical accuracy. They like the rich, detailed world. They like to know that someone is treating them with the respect 
and they put a work into the game. And they really give their love back when they see that this is what they get. In Battlefield 5, from the first version of this game that I presented, right now it's just a completely different story. The game is rewritten to be more historical accurate because that's what gamers wanted. Sometimes this is a distortion in between what companies would like to give them versus what they really want. And we don't have to play with political correctness because our history, Polish history, is just it's just product that is already made and easy and ready to sell. So, we have our own heroes, our own stories, and the victories. Let's use them. This is my call to action for everyone in the industry, because no one is going to tell our stories if we don't do that, and we have every tools, every companies, every right, moral, or any other that you can imagine, to start to speak about untold history of the Second World War, and this is what Poland is all about. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mikowski.